thank you very much, Sheila. There's lots of uh, scientists in the room, I know, so uh, now's the, the time to come up and uh, have some questions. Simon. Hi, Izzy. Sorry, <clears throat> my question was to Izzy. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Is there any evidence these are TH17 or TH17.1 cells? Sorry? Are these TH17 or TH17.1 cells, I did express T, but and ROR gamma T? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That's a really good question. So in our in vitro models, in addition to looking at um, our secreted R17, we also look for um, um, raw gamma T and stat phosphorylated STAT3. And we show that the TH17 expressing cells have higher expression of raw gamma T and phosphorylated STAT3. Um, that's a good point. We haven't looked at, we haven't co-stained for TBET um, because one of the interesting questions is also, um, there's this concept of um, plasticity between yeah, exactly. TH17, TH1, yeah. and um, T regulatory T cells, depending on the cytokines you have there. So it's something we're planning to look at. And just a follow-up question. I mean, obviously, the innate compartment has the IL IL3 cells, mm -hmm. which are also lymphoid-inducing. Have you had a chance to look in the specimens that you've got to see if there's any suggestion those are co-segregating with the TH17 cells? Again, another interesting question. We haven't looked at the the RL, RLC3s. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have, um, interestingly, because um, part of the, I've done some work on gamma delta T cells in the past, and we know that gamma delta T cells uh, can produce R17. There are, in human tumors, there appears to be a small compartment of CD3 positive, CD4, CD8 double negative. And we know that gamma delta T cells are quite highly represented in the liver. So again, this is um, something I'm interested in investigating. No, thank you. Thank you. Kiara. Uh, thank you, Izzy. I have um, a follow-up question on that because you show that, or at least you hypothesize that your ILC, IL-17 producing cells are co-localizing with the um, lymphopathic uh, um, invasion. Were your tumors uh, um, assessed for uh, positivity of lymph nodes? Did, were, you know, were, did you find cancer cells in the lymph nodes? So, and uh, oh, I think the, the question is, uh, do you think is uh, your cells which will induce the lymphovascular invasion or is these cells that differentiate because they are close to the lymphopathic uh, um, vessels? Okay, thank you for your question, Chiara. So part of, um, so like I said, we started with the training set of an N of 10, and part of what we're um, interested in looking at, apart from the potential for repurposing anti-R17s for treatment, is the use of um, microvascular density in R17 positive tumors as a prognostic feature. So can we determine which patients are going to do better or worse? So the, our working hypothesis right now is that you, you, because you have increased R17, maybe not only because of these T cells, but definitely they're a contributing factor, that these tumors will um, have increased lymphangiogenesis. And because of the increased lymphangiogenesis, you will eventually have increased tumor seeding to the lymph nodes. So we have data on the patient's um, retrospectively collected data on whether there were there were positive lymph nodes. So our, our workflow, what we're planning to do is, first of all, develop a robust algorithm to analyze um, uh, whether the, 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 the fact that you have the lymphatic vessels in the neighborhood of the TH positive, positive uh, TH17 positive cells, whether that's actually a valid biological phenomenon. Because I'm always very wary of uh, is it just there because it's there or is it there because it has a biological significance and the next step down the workflow would then be can we correlate this neighborhood analysis to which patients then went on to have worse um, lymph node involvement and worse outcome mm -hmm. thank you thank you Jesus hi congratulations for this uh, two very nice presentation um, first my question go to you she um, the data on interleukin-17 in general in cancer are quite controversial. Um, it has been suggested that it might promote a tumor initiation and growth in early stages, but once the tumor is already established, it has been uh, proposed and, and social data that it also promotes anti-tumor immunity. So do you, do you have any evidence that this might occur in cholangiocarcinoma? Yes, no, did you see differences in, uh, in the levels of these cells in different tumor stages? Um, again, that's, uh, thank you, Isis, that's a good question. Um, we haven't 
separated out, it out into tumor stages, firstly, because we have such a small end number. Um, and you're right, uh, one of the beauties for me, but annoyances for other people is that immune cells will do different things depending very much on the microenvironment where they're in. Um, we know um, and it, from some work that's been done in colorectal cancer and work that's been done so far in cholangio that the L17 positive cells seem to have a pro-tumorogenic effect. So that's the uh, hypothesis we're currently working off of. But you're right, it would be interesting to see whether this is different in terms of stages. Um, we just need the numbers to make sure the data is robust. And, and do you have any evidence of uh, any correlation of expression between interleukin-17 and uh, immuno checkpoint uh, genes? Do you, do, is there any association? No, I haven't looked um, okay. for the immune checkpoint genes. I, I, for now, I just want to, because it's such a hot topic, I want to stare <laughs> away from the immune <laughs> checkpoint genes for now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Isi. Uh, Luke. Thanks. Um, so it's to Sheila, actually. Um, so what is regulating your PRH expression as you kind of transition from that kind of pre-malignant state into a cancer? Um, I know you said you've got this feed-forward loop with notch three, but what sets that up? Do you have any ideas? That's a very good question. I mean, it could be um, bile, acid, bile acids themselves, because we have investigated to see uh, whether normal bile duct cells can respond to bile acids uh, in terms of the expression of PRH, and they can, whereas our tumor cells are not sensitive to bile acids. So it could be the bile acid composition, the flow um, that sets it up. Um, could be notch three itself, though. So That's interesting. I've got a, a, another question, if that's OK. So setting up the cancer, and this is kind of to everyone, I guess. So setting up your, your undergraduate degree in cancer sciences, if you were doing it again, what would you do differently? What, what are the successes and the kind of pitfalls that you faced? <laughs> I'll, I'll answer that one, because I'm the director of the program, so I'm, I'm responsible for the, for the good and the bad. Um, if I was setting it up again, uh, we set up two programs. We set up an undergraduate bachelor's degree and, um, and also an MSI degree. Um, and the MSI degree is, ha has some advantages, but if I was doing it again, I probably wouldn't set up both at the same time. I'd probably set up the bachelor's <laughs> first, and then after about two years, I would set up the <laughs> master's rather than doing everything at once. So it's, yeah, how many do you want to do? It's too many. Thank you. Shahid. So um, I had a question for Izzy. So really great presentations. Really, really enjoyed it. Enjoyed them all. Um, so it's following on from um, Professor Banalis' question about the, the IL-17. And, uh, and, and maybe by the time you're, you're thinking of suppressing it, it's too late. And whether you think suppression of, of that pathway might be uh, more relevant in a neoadjuvant or even adjuvant setting. Again, that's, it's, it's a possibility. I think one of the problems um, or one of the limitations is, as um, Jesus rightly said, you have positive and negative R17 effects. And what you don't want to do is have a blanket block yeah. If you're thinking of uh, repurposing um, ustekinumab, what you don't want to do is have a blanket block where you then turn off some of the positive effects. So I think if we, un I think if we understand, so I'm only um, I'm looking at, I've only mentioned two potential ways in which R17 might affect the tumor. So one is through lymphatic vessel development, but also have we, as we've seen through um, mm. PRH. I think if we can understand these specific mechanisms through which R17 might potentially work in cholangia, that would help to inform maybe at what point it would be better to give this drug. So like you say, as a neoadjuvant yeah. therapy. I mean, it, yeah. it, would there be a way to pre-select patients who you think actually suppression of T or, or file 17 at an earlier stage? Then um, I think in theory, it's a good concept, but then the problem is, as we discussed yesterday, how do you select patients at an early stage? Yeah. Because part of the idea in, at least for, for with my pathology hat on is if you, if we can, we can very easily identify lymphangiogenesis in the tumor samples, um, we receive. We can set. Uh, we can develop algorithms to quantify lymphangiogenesis, and maybe re retrospectively say, oh, th if the patient is still alive, this person has 
X number of new lymphatic vessels, we think potentially they will do worse, so they need more aggressive treatment. But then, as we said yesterday, by the time you get that tumour, by the time you get the tumour out, it's already progressed. So the key thing is how do we identify them early enough to know whether they would benefit yeah. from using the anti-IL-17? Yeah. We, can't, we do get cytology, but sometimes the, the tissue in the cytology is so little that if you make a cytoblock, you can't really do anything with it apart from just do the diagnostic thing. So that's yeah. still a huge roadblock. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jesus has another question. Yeah, uh, my question goes to Sheila. Uh, regarding PRH, in the introduction, you commented that this is an important transcription factor for biliary development. As you know, uh, the primary cilium is a very important sensory organ of cholangiocytes that promotes uh, multiple uh, regulation of the cell. But in cholangiocarcinoma, this organ is absent. Uh, it's absent promoting the differentiation. Do you have any data or any thought on the potential role of this gene in primary cilium uh, regulation? We haven't... We haven't particularly looked uh, at that. that I, I can't really comment on that because we haven't been looking at that. Okay, yeah, because you commented actually that also it regulates a cycle, and the cell cycle is very much regulated by the uh, centrosomes of the, of the cilium, the bisal bodies. So it would be, I think, interesting to, to take a look at uh, the potential Absolutely. role. Because, yeah. Thank you. Hassan. It's, it's more of a kind of comment rather than a question, just taking on um, Shahid's thing. I presume most of these, uh, this IL-17, most of these are probably intrapatic cholangiocarcinomas. And as surgeons, we tend not to do lymphadenectomy in those cases. So you may not have lymph nodes. But if you're doing a, a pre-surgical biopsy and able to identify this high-risk population, that may guide subsequent changes to the operative plan. And that perhaps is one way of taking it forward. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question to, to Sheila. Um, obviously, we have uh, uh, patients and, and advocates in the room as well. Can you just talk us through what the steps would be to get this drug 56 in combination with papacyclib into the clinic from where you are at the moment? Well, I think the next step would be, of course, to do a mouse models um, to, to see that the two drugs do are efficacious in combination and also in patient-derived models. Those two um, things is what we would like to do next. Um, but once we can get over that, I think we should be able to quite rapidly go into a, a, a clinical trial because you know a lot of the drug effects uh, are already well established. So we just have to make sure that it wasn't terribly toxic. And then... Once it gets into the clinic, then of course it goes into the early phase combination trials and then gradually works its way through and takes a few years. Uh, Helen. I, I think you may have, have preempted my question <laughs> somewhat, uh, one. And obviously I'm not a scientist, but what I'm going to ask is, is you know, from the point of view of, of the patient. Firstly, thank you all of you for such fantastic presentations. And you pitched them at a perfect level that even I could understand so thank you very much and um, I just picked up on something that Izzy said but actually you know it, it was equally I suppose to Sheila although you've asked that question um, so if Izzy your data support the hypothesis of your IL-17 work um, can you explain what sort of timeline would there be on moving that work forward to a clinical trial proposal so it may have, that may have already been answered but that that was what I'd like to know okay um, thank you Helen um, I think that for us the the intricate part or the part that might take the longest would be to show quite strong mechanism for how IL-17 would work in a cholangi in cholangiocarcinoma um, um, lots of people have alluded to the fact that it's Unfortunately, like a lot of cytokines, it doesn't just have one effect. So blocking it can have off-target effects. Um, and we have to be really careful that by blocking it, we're not switching off some other pathway. Because again, the beauty of the immune system is that it's all kind of linked. And in fact, in like, like I mentioned, the anti-IL-17 medication is standard of care for psoriasis and, and rheumatoid arthritis, but only in very severe cases. 
because as we find with a lot of especially anti-cytokine therapies because cytokines uh, have so much far so many far-reaching effects they are only prescribed really carefully so i think that we would need to establish like really clear strong mechanisms of how they work it wouldn't be enough to say observationally that oh patients who have increased our 17 do worse so if we can block it they might do better we need to show that blocking it doesn't cause something else to go wrong before that we will be able to translate that but i think one of the, the the nice things is especially represented in this room we have so much of the expertise that we need to get those experiments done fairly rapidly in what as we said yesterday is considered a relatively rare cancer but we can get that work done very fairly rapidly just because of the links and the, the collaborative links that we have in the room so i'm i'm really um i might this might sound naive but i'm quite hopeful and positive <laughs> Yeah. Sounds exciting. Another Hi. question. Hi. Uh, so my question is for Kevin. I know Kevin is my supervisor. I could have asked him this question <laughs> anytime, really, but it just came up to my mind. But you know, in your undergrad and master science uh, program, PhD students take part in bench-wise supervision. And um, I know, I mean, uh, especially international PhD students, where when we go back home, I mean, we get our PhD yes, degree. And then if we do anything after that, we do, uh, we get recognition for that. But do you think we can get certificate from the program itself that we took part in the supervision? Because we literally spend like a uh, long time with them in the lab, like per day, we can say like half of the time is with them and half of the time is for our own work. And having really a certificate indicating that we took part in this bench-wise supervision and teaching would have, would be really helpful for us when we go back home and start teaching in universities? Thank you. I think that's a really good idea. Uh, you should have told me about earlier. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure you only just thought of it now, but yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good idea because one of the things that um, I think all undergraduate degree programs do is to, is to make use of, of PhD students and, and postdocs as well to do some of the teaching. And it would be good to, to formally recognize that in some kind of a, of a way, uh, in the way that new lecturers can get a, you know, uh, various certificates and, and qualifications. So uh, yes, thank you, we will do that. Yeah, because we know in Manchester they have a PhD program with teaching certificate. The teaching, ah, right, yeah. I didn't know that. I mean, I, I should have really directed the question to someone who's in PhD uh, program management, but then we do take part in the undergrad and uh, master, uh, master of Science cancer. Mm program so we will steal Manchester's yeah. idea <laughs> <laughs> I mean uh, so now you have to <laughs> yeah when we think about it we've like we spend up on average like four years here but when we go back all we have is like uh, our words that we took part in education there but we don't have any evidence of that very good point thank you very much it's, it's so exciting to see not so, not just the next generation of researchers but teachers as well I think uh, Jesus has another question yeah well uh, final one. Yeah, well, interleukin-17 is a hot topic. So, uh, now my question goes, uh, because there are different subtypes of cholangiocarcinoma yes. being described according to the gene expression profile, like metabolic, inflammatory, proliferative, and the same at the mutational level. Do you, did you do any uh, sub-analysis on the expression of uh, IL-17 according to these uh, different subtypes, or, or is it a general event, or is it more specific to certain subtypes? So it's... Uh, Again, really good question. It's a gen we've done general because one of the problems, one of the existing problems is that even when we probe the TCGA, the number of cholangios represented in the T TCGA is quite small. Um, and if you try to split them apart, then you lose your power. So what we started, we know that, as, as again was said yesterday, that um, they're different biological entities. Um, and in fact, that's one of... I have lots of big ideas. That's one of the reasons I was so happy to collaborate with Luke and with Enska because we have, through Luke and Enska, we have potentially have access to so many cholangiocarcinoma tumors that would allow us, uh, tumor samples, that would allow us to drill down to the real biological basis of, of 
what we think is happening within tumours. Uh, it's really exciting to see like all the sequencing data, inflammatory versus metabolic. But again, I, I'm always very wary of single snapshot pictures of tumours. I'm a huge fan of spatial, spatial and temporal analysis, because I think if you dissect a tumour and do RNA sequencing, you're getting a single snapshot. You're not taking into account the physical relationships between the cells and how that influences the biology. So yes, that's a really uh, important question and something we're hoping to um, look at. I'm planning my whole clinical research <laughs> career right here. <laughs> Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the whole team from Nottingham for fantastic presentations and for engaging us with uh, those answers. So thank you very much. Thank you.